Hi everyone, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebase.com. Thanks for joining me for another video. And I'm joined by uh, two good friends, Lauren Pierce and Jason Heath. Now, Lauren is a fantastic soloist, bass teacher. You can find her at laurenpiercebasslessons.com. And she's also the co-host of Ask Jeff and Lauren, which is a show on Discoverdouble Bass. And Jason Heath is our guest today. Uh, he's from Contra Bass Conversations podcast and also from doublebassblog.org. Is that right, Jason? Have I got the that URL That is right. Correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Fantastic. And I'll basically add all the links so you can find these guys online in the show notes uh, below this video. But what I'm going to do today is throw out a question and we're going to have a chat about it. So if it's okay, Lauren, I'll maybe kick off with you. I'm going to ask the question to you. And this is a, a really broad topic um, okay. that we can talk about with base education um, and just answer it in any way that you uh, in any way that you fancy. So what I'm asking you guys is, what qualities and practices have you seen in your base students who make the most progress? So what comes oh, to wow. mind? It's a huge yeah, question. Yeah, that is a very broad topic, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's a good one, though. I think a lot of people talk so much about the exercises that they can do and the pieces they can play and should I play with curved or collapsed fingers or, or whatever. Um, but really, the traits that people, it's kind of like the discussion of, you know, what do happy people do? Are yeah. they just naturally happy or... Um, are these traits just things that, you know, go into being happy? And I think a lot of the students that I have, I'm really fortunate, are very enthusiastic. Hmm. And I found that the students that, I mean, it, it sounds kind of silly, but the students that care the most are the, going to be the ones that are going to work the hardest. And they're also going to be the ones that are just going to keep going. You know, I think when you get to a certain level or you get to a certain point or you've been working for a while and you aren't making the progress that you think you're going to, it's easy for you to kind of back off a little bit and say, maybe I'm just doing something wrong or this isn't as interesting anymore. But the students that I have that really go far and really, really do well are the ones that are enthusiastic and just keep at it every single day, just every day, wake up, do their thing every day, no matter how good or bad of a day that they're having. Yeah, that sounds great. What about you, Jason? What comes to mind when we're talking about great students who've had the, the ones that really made the most pro progress with you? Yeah, well, Lauren hits on the, the what I think is the key point, which is it's it, having success as a student. It's it's a lot of the same aspects as having success as a person. So I think it's if you look at just improving yourself as a person, those are the similar traits that I see. So if I look, I think if I were, there were three key components for success for a student. And I think that's consistency, which is what Lauren was talking about. Even if you're having the worst day, the best day, this keep it, keeping at it, your, your, your girlfriend broke up with you, keeping at it. That, uh, so consistency uh, and, and perseverance goes into that too. Just you hit plateaus in your development and just being able to work through that. And I think the most important thing probably more than those two, is just open-mindedness, just being willing to try something different, to try to find a way. I talk a lot with my students about the, the, how they're, maybe they're practicing, they're not getting better, and I'll walk into a wall, I'll visibly walk into a wall to show them what they're doing. And just being open-minded, try to find some solution where you can find some door you didn't know that was there. Uh, those three traits, I think, are what yeah. really yeah. do it. And I think to add on to your last one, sorry to jump in no, again, on. but... No. Um, on your last one, I think another big one is curiosity, you know? I think there's a yeah. quote, I don't remember, it might be somebody important like Buddha or, or somebody, I can't remember, but um, it's something like you can't be depressed if you're curious. And that's always really struck me because the students that I have and the people that I know that are really good at what they do are still curious about what they're doing, how they can improve, other things that they can do that maybe or maybe don't relate to what they're doing. and. Um, I kind of find that when I get in a little bit of a bind and I'm not able to be as enthusiastic as I would like to be, I find something that is interesting to me, you know, another piece I can work on or another technique I'd like to learn, something like that. I don't know. What do you think, Jeff? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a huge thing, isn't it, really? I think one of the things that you said, uh, 
Lauren or maybe Jason actually I'm not sure one of you was we're, we're talking about consistency um, and I think that this idea about being really consistent and um, Lauren's spoken to me in the past about having a set amount that you don't go below and that really has struck me this year particularly I've been getting back into practicing um, in a big way and I've been trying to not fall below um, an hour's playing a day and I might do four hours I might do less uh, you know whatever I could do more um, but I'm trying to not allow myself to fall below that whereas I used to think about about doing a minimum of an hour and it's the same sort of uh, sorry or I used to think about working in these hour sessions and desperately trying to get as many in as possible but actually just getting in you know but getting behind the base and putting the hours in in a really mm-hmm. kind of thoughtful way um I think that the I think also having um having the discipline to work through the hard point um, so you start to see the results. And I think whoever you're studying with, you should really like commit to what they're, they're asking you to do. Because if you love their playing and you love the, the way that they teach and you're studying with them, I think sometimes people get too distracted uh, by you know what uh, other things. They might suddenly switch between French bow and German bow and then French bow again and suddenly gut strings. And before you know it, all these other distractions that are out there and approaches and you know methods. And I think that all of them require um a real amount of uh well discipline really and just doing it repeatedly um yeah. but that yeah i think the other thing just on a completely different uh point would be playing live as well i think you've got yeah. to be able to um put into practice um you know what you're practicing uh, if you like so you've got playing live and then you go and have a lesson and your teacher will give you some stuff to practice you'll go and practice and then you'll play live and all of these things you know encourage the others um, and overall mm-hmm. it helps you make more progress so I say say yes to these ensemble uh, opportunities that will come your way as a double bass player even if you don't think that you're ready um, yeah I think just putting yourself out there in general is a great thing to do you know and when you make the first the first plunge, you know, where you just put that first video out there, you play that first yeah. piece or whatever for, you know, your master class or whatever. I think that's a great way to just keep yourself interested. And, um, and you, you learn so much. My dad used to say, uh, one gig is like a year's worth of practicing. Yeah. I think he just told me that just, you know. I think I think your dad is uh, onto some good stuff. But just to finish <laughs> yeah. off, guys, what about a couple of quick things here? Um, if I ask you another question, what are the kind of common mistakes that you see students make? Um, what do you think, Jason? Is there anything that you've seen students, students do in their approach or the way that they're practicing that you think is perhaps hindering their progress? Yeah, and this kind of ties into what we were talking about. I think uh, people put blinders on a lot of the time. They get so myopic in what they're working on. And I, I look back to, you know, I actually have a great uh, anecdote from Jeff Bradisage, who Lauren oh. studied with, and I studied with a little bit in high school. And he was talking uh, to a bass player who just would not leave the practice room. And, and Jeff was saying, how are you ever going to know what a babbling brook sounds like if you don't go outside and experience <laughs> it? And the, the person sternly looked and said, basses don't babble. <laughs> so you're like, okay, fine. But just getting out, I look at the people that I went to school with, and the people that went to concerts on Friday night, went to see the Chicago Symphony, went to just experience and read and went to the Art Institute, those ended up being the people that were successful, however you define that, by yeah. and large, more than the people that hold themselves up in the practice room on Friday night and just worked on their scales mm-hmm. and arpeggios and pieces. I mean, over time, you, you have to have something to say. And you find mm-hmm. inspiration from all these sources that you never know. And within the arts and literature, and it's not just bass, uh, it, you, you got to become a more interesting artist. And the, w- the way to do that is just experience life through all these modalities. Yeah, maybe, yeah absolutely. Maybe, maybe I could jump in because it, mine follows on directly from jo- Jason, which is that I was just thinking that the bass players who are really open to learning and sharing, and uh, I got so much from spending time in the practice room with other bass players and working through pieces and being, and some people were really kind of, they kept their cards close to their chest and they weren't really <laughs> looking to share and, and improve and, and give everyone opportunities. But actually, I, it's other bass players that have helped me the most. You know, I mean, teachers, yeah. absolutely, but other bass players um, have just given me so much and the friendship and support and uh, stuff that I've learned. How about you, Lauren? Have you, is there any sort of common mistakes you can think of to finish this off? Well, to go off of what you were saying about just being social, I think a yeah. lot of people get really caught up in like competition and jealousy. And I personally do not do well when I'm feeling competitive or like yes. feeling threatened, if that's how you want to put it. And a lot of times I would go into a situation where I would be with a bunch of bass players or a bunch of 
classical musicians or, or whatever and think, oh, so many friends I can make. And the situation is just so different where people are very much about just what they're doing and they don't, they're not interested in socializing. But mm -hmm. I agree with both of you that that's kind of where the magic happens, you know, where you're talking about music and you're sharing, oh, have you listened to this recording? Um, just the other day I was talking to another friend who's auditioning for the same opera that mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to be doing, and um, he was having a hard time with the excerpt, so I said, oh, well, you should listen to Jason Heath's podcast about that, you know, <laughs> and that would never happen if we had just decided we were just going to be pit against each other, you know. Um, one last thing I would say is, it, it's sort of going along the same lines, but not listening to music, you know, oh, that's yeah. big. Yeah. You'd, you'd be surprised at how many musicians don't listen to music, <laughs> and yeah. I think First of all, just enjoying what you do is is important, but also there's a lot of there are a lot of things that you're going to learn from other soloists or other orchestral musicians that I'm not going to be able to tell you as your teacher. You know, like phrasing is such a weird topic to talk about, mm -hmm. and I can explain to you my thought process, but you know, sometimes say if you're playing um, just the Rococo variations, just to give an example, it would be much better for you to listen to your favorite cellist play that or your favorite bass player play that and hear what they're doing and get inspired that way. I mean, there's so many things that you can learn from phrasing to technique by just listening to music that you're not necessarily going to be able to be explained to, you know. Absolutely. Well, listen, I think that's a fantastic point to wrap this up, guys. I just, of course, want to thank Lauren, as usual, uh, for coming down and hanging out with me. Uh, it's been great seeing you again, Lauren. And Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. You can learn more about Jason's podcast over at ContrabassConversations.com and the uh, blog is DoubleBassBlog.org. Um, so, yeah, thanks, guys, and we'll see everybody next time. Hey, thanks a lot.